Any, anybody here ever struggle at all with being a people pleaser? So, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's something we do pretty easily and naturally. And, and what I've heard my whole life, especially my adult life, is, is don't be a people pleaser. Have you all seen that? You've seen those, those, those wild-looking graphics on Facebook <laughs> chewing you out for being a people pleaser. And, and, uh, and then some of them say things that are very godly, like just please yourself. Just learn to please yourself. That's, that's pretty godly, isn't it? So, but, but that's wrong. That's wrong. And, and uh, we're going to talk about that today. And, and we're in Romans chapter 15. If you want to go there, we're going to be doing verses 1 through 7. If you're a guest today, we always have notes. I think almost every scripture today I use will be in your notes, and we've got blanks to fill in as we go. But I want to start off with, remember that in chapter 14, the Apostle Paul was talking about weak Christians and strong Christians and the impact that we have on each other. And, and believe it or not, he was calling the weak Christians, listen to this if you didn't catch this, the people he were calling weak, he wasn't calling weak because they were brand new Christians. He was calling weak because they had been very religious their whole life and they spent all their time judging everybody for not being as religious as they were. Now I know in church, you guys have been in church, that you thought that those people judging you were the strong Christians and it made you feel bad and all that. And the Apostle Paul's told us in the last chapter that, look, those people that were judging you because you danced or you did whatever, whatever crazy thing you had in your church that you weren't allowed to do, you, 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 uh, you were judged for, those were weak Christians. And he calls the strong Christians were the ones that, that understood, the, um, understood the freedom that we have in Christ. And, and, and he was telling us basically that there's a freedom we have, a liberty that we give each other for the unnecessary things. And he's talking here particularly about something that was a big deal back then. You've got to realize the church of Rome, the Christian church in Rome, was made up of Jews and Gentiles, people that worshipped all kinds of weird idols. The Jews were used to doing church on Saturday. The new Christians all wanted to do church on Sunday because that was Resurrection Day. And so all of this kind of stuff is going on. And the Apostle Paul is talking about the importance of us being a good, positive influence on each other and helping each other grow. Now, it's, it's weird because in the Bible, the Bible you have, what if I was to tell you to turn to a place in the Bible where the Apostle Paul said such and such, and I didn't give you a chapter and a verse? How many of you would take a little while for you to get there? You know, the chapters and the verses weren't put in until like the 1200s. So, so the Bible had been written a long time before somebody got the idea, hey, it might be easier to find things if we put chapter and verse in. So, so that's what they did. And, and probably if you were to look at chapter 14 and chapter 15, you would go, I don't know if I would have put a chapter place right there because in 15, he's kind of going right into what he was talking about in 14. So anybody been reading ahead? Anybody saw my title and thought, well, how's Royal going to? go with this. I'll tell you something, depending on the version, translation, you were looking at this last week. Uh, I put on Facebook this week, are, are we supposed to be people pleasers? And I got definite no from several of them except Buffy. <laughs> and Buffy gave one of those answers where you didn't know whether she knew what I was talking about or not. So, but, um, but I wanted to start off with Hebrews 10.25, and I gave you this verse last week. And remember, I, I said that, that I, I talked about the fact that when Lisa and I have this favorite restaurant that we go to, and, and, uh, and we love their food and everything that they have, but the last two times we've gone, the last two times we've gone, the, the stuff that I loved all of a sudden wasn't so stuff that I loved and 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 it was I recommended this place to everybody and all of a sudden now I'm having second thoughts do we want to go back to this place again and take another chance on the food still screwed up 
And you do that when you go to a place as a consumer. When you go to a place as a consumer, you're going there going, I'm going there because I want this to give me what I want. I want it to taste good. I want it to feel good. I want the bathrooms to be clean. I want the air conditioning to work. I, uh, those are all, I want the waiter to be nice. And, and all of those kind of things we think about. And then we said, you know, but that's not what church is. See, most people's lives change spiritually when they realize that the gathering of believers is not about meeting my need, your need. It's about serving others. And if you've been in church any time at all, and our church is full of people who were once church and now they're back in church for the first time in their life, you, you've seen people bickering and carrying on about everything from the color of the carpet to the walls to whatever and splitting churches and all that other kind of stuff. And, and, and basically what that means was they were not doing what they were called to do as part of the church. And, it will, and, I, and I got to thinking, what if we applied that to other things? What if that restaurant, I decided that I really like that restaurant, so I'm going to go back and try to make them better. I'm going to be a better customer. I'm going to tip the waiter better, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm doing it for... I mean, isn't that a completely different way of looking at things? And, and that's the way church is. Most people, they wake up on Sunday morning, if they're not completely devoted and committed to their church, they wake up on Sunday morning and decide whether they're going to go to church or not. And that's an, a consumerism idea. Look at this passage in, in Hebrews 10.25. Remember last week I told you, what if this was the only, one of the only verses you have in the Bible? What would it tell you about what you're supposed to do? Look what it says. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. Okay, that's pretty clear. That's not a gray thing. It's a, it's a, it's a right or wrong thing. But encourage one another. That's a, that's a job description. For all of us here on Sunday morning, when you walk in, it doesn't matter if you're on the first touch team or you're serving in the children's area or, or, or whatever, our jobs, we're called to do what? Say it with me. Encourage one another. That's what we're called to do. And, and we're not supposed to just, just call each other on the phone and encourage one another. By the way, which is a, which is a, it's an awesome thing to call and encourage someone, especially out of the blue. But we're to meet together and encourage one another. That's what our job is. So when you wake up on Sunday morning, then, you know, when, when I go to that restaurant again, I'm going to think, oh, should I order the pork chops or should I? Because they screwed up the sirloin steak last time. And no, when I come to church, I'm going to go, who can I encourage? I'm here to encourage. And I want to tell you something. Worship will be better than you ever thought if you come here to encourage. Church will be more fun than you ever thought it would be if you come here to encourage. But if you come here as a consumer, how many things will you see that you don't like that will get you to the point where you say, I'm going to go find another church? And it is hard for those of you that have searched for churches it's a very unhappy, not good thing to be doing that. So that's our job, and that is, is to encourage one another when we're here. And, and, and the first thing on your note with a blank is this. It's never about pleasing ourselves. What's never about pleasing ourselves? Church, being a Christian. It's never, you could just mark that off, it's never about pleasing ourselves. Now, God wants you to be full of joy and content. That would please you, wouldn't it? But you get joy and contentment from serving others. Isn't that crazy? See, that goes, that's, that, that so doesn't go with, with what our human selfishness think, but it goes with what the Jesus unselfishness was, is. Look at, um... Romans 15, verse 1, and this is the New Living Translation. We who are strong, and this is Paul, he's talking, those of us who are, who are strong in the faith, 
we must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. Remember, he's talking about church on Saturday or Sunday or the things that we eat, but you can apply that to, to everything we do with each other. We must not, say it with me, just please ourselves. That's not what it's about. People tell me all the time, I can do this if I want. I got the freedom to do that. But that's not what it's all about. It's not about ourselves. There's the essentials, the right and wrongs. Now, we, it, it's important. I'm going to give you a verse in just a minute that will, that will, that everybody, when, when you say, uh, when, when Christians say that it's not our job to please other people, they're going to use this verse that I'm going to use in just a minute. But you've got to always use Scripture in the context of all of Scripture. That's how cults get started. Ooh, I like this verse. I like this verse. I'm going to build my religion on these two verses that will scare the crud out of everybody. You know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of verses in Scripture. They're the only ones you had. They would scare the crud out of you until you put them in the context of the whole thing. Remember, there are the essential and the non-essentials. In the, in the essentials, we have unity. In the non-essentials, the right, in the essentials, the right and wrong, it's clear in the Word of God. We have a job as a part of the family, and that's to encourage one another. Look at verse 2. Here we go again. Verse 2. We should help others do what is right and, say this with me, build them up in the Lord. See, we, we do things to get people connected. That's what we do. We, church, obviously, you connect, but you don't connect as good here as you could connect in other places. We, we do uh, potlucks like we did last week by the way if y'all didn't see the very cool three minute time lapse potluck potluck go go in and see that it was pretty cool y'all were all moving pretty fast and what was cool was every once in a while you saw the yellow orange or red lcc shirt come in come in so and i just forgot totally what i was talking about <laughs> we're to build one another up we should help each other and build one another up in the Lord. Now, that is the New Living Translation, which I use all the time to teach. But look at the NIV translation. Each of us should what? Please our neighbors. So here's a question. Is it wrong to be a people pleaser? Not according to that. You see, some of y'all just freaked out totally on that because you've you just been here in your whole life. I'm not supposed to please other people. I'm not, and, and, but each of us should please our neighbors. Why? Why? Because that's going to be the problem. It's for their good and to build them up. It's to build a relationship with them so that they trust you and you can build them up. I told y'all a few weeks ago about the, the student I had that was a, you know, came in all gangster and everything. And after a few weeks of me, me, me respecting him and all that, he, he wanted me to go to coffee. And the first thing he asked, because he trusted me now after several weeks of working with me, the first thing he asked is, do you think that people respect me? And because of the relationship I had, I could have honestly said no. But if the first day he walked into class like that, I'd said, dude, you quit talking like that and go, you know, go change clothes before you come back in here. I would have lost that guy and would have never had any kind of positive influence on him. That's what he talks about, about pleasing. It's building that relationship for the purpose of building them up. Now, remember, this is he's talking to Christians about other Christians. So it's our job to build each other up so that we're better Christians. For our unbelieving friends, it's important for us to build them up and build our relationship so that they'll trust us when we tell them about a relationship with Jesus Christ. So, I've heard my whole life that I need to be my own person. I've heard people say I need to make myself happy. I've heard people say, look out for number one. I've heard people say that's how you have a happy life. We know that's not true. The suicide level of people that are looking for their happy life doing that is, is pretty high. The wrong way of pleasing people is to please people. The wrong way of pleasing people is to please people so that I can get approval of my own. People pleasing is wrong. It's the motive for which we please that determines whether it is wrong or right. It's the motive why now what did i just tell you the motive should be to build them up and to make them better here's where people pleasing is wrong 
If I need your approval in order to feel good about myself, that's when people pleasing is wrong. Because where should I be getting, whose approval should I be working on? On God's. That should be, that should be, that should be the void. God should be the one that's filling the void in my life that I'm trying to fill with the approval of, of other people. It's, it's wrong if we please people to, for, to, to, be, to be pleased. Somehow that didn't come out right. Pleasing to please people for selfish reasons. I don't think I put selfish reasons on your notes. I think I added that because I saw that on there. For selfish reasons. If, if I'm doing it for me. And look, this is, this is something you do naturally. You're born to need other people. There's been enough terrible stories we've seen of babies that have been neglected that it affects them emotionally, psychologically, and physically. We need those relationships. And as we get older, it's important that we realize that we stop trying to get all those approval needs met by other people. And because a lot of it has to do with the health we had with our parents. If, we, if, we, if we've got this, a lot of us get this void from our parents that, that, that we just feel like we've got to fill all the time. But it's, it's important to realize that we've got to switch that over to God. I, I put down some. I just put down some things. If you're a people pleaser, that you struggle with. If your if your reason is is to get your own needs met, we feel like we're lacking approval. We struggle with anger. We struggle with resentment. We're easily taken advantage of. We are codependent in that our emotions are determined what other people think about us. Some of us will just develop a habit of avoiding people at all costs. That's not good for your career, is it? or marriage for that matter, depression and the need to always feel like you have to be the one in control. And then all it takes is just one negative opinion from someone who means nothing to you to make you feel miserable and to doubt yourselves. So the answer is, are we to be people pleasers it's yes and no. It depends on what your motive is, why you're going about doing what you do. Look at this verse. Here's the verse that people use all the time to, out of context, I believe, to, to hammer on us for being people. This is a verse that, you know, there, there are churches, there, would, there are some people from churches who would walk into our building today and they'd say, you know what's wrong with you? Your people, you don't have, all have Bibles. You know what's wrong with you? You don't sing out of hymnals. You know what's wrong with you? You don't have an organ. We were, we, I was talking to a church one time. We were talking about actually merging with this church. And, and one of their elders walked in and said, If a drum set ever turns up on my church, I'm out of here and my money with me. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? That the people... People believe that, that those are, the reason they believe those things are wrong is, is they think that you're getting away from the truth of the Word of God. This is an old lie. I had a, I had a guy actually say to me one time that, that if the King James Version was good enough for the Apostle Paul, then it's good enough for me. Well, the King James Version was written in the 1600s, in case you didn't know. So <laughs> the Apostle Paul died like 1,500 years before that. So... <laughs> Look at Galatians 1.10. Now, the Apostle Paul is, this is where we go from the unnecessary to the necessary, talking the truths of the Word of God and how important they are. Obviously, Paul says, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God in everything that I do. And if pleasing people were my goal, then I would not be Christ's servant. So, so, so the reason we're kind and forgiving and, 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 um, and ministered to and let things slide and, 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 and to weaker Christians is because we're pleasing God. It's our job to help build them up. The right way is to please people to honor God and honor God's truth. That's, that's the right way. And the rewards that come with that are what? Fruits of the Spirit. I don't think this one's on your notes, is it? Look at Galatians 5. There it is. 
The Holy Spirit, and y'all, we say this verse all the time, and I hope you get it. What happened just a few sentences before this, the Apostle Paul said, look, if you live like the rest of the world and you're not hooked up to God, then, then he basically says you're going to hell in a handbasket. Do all kinds of crazy things. But if you stay connected to the Holy Spirit, it'll produce in you these things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. And everybody you know, everybody, you don't know anybody that's not looking for these things. Every single person you know, even that weak Christian you know who acts so legalistic and judgmental all the time, they're missing these things. This is what comes in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And this is what God uses us when we're living our lives this way. This has such a positive impact on other people that other people want what we got. So how do we be the right kind of people pleaser? Just here's some few things from Romans 15, verses 1 through 7. First of all, be God's love with skin. Be like Jesus. Be God's love with skin. Be like Jesus. Verse 3, for even Christ didn't live, say this with me, to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O oh God, have fallen on me. He was, he was quoting a, a prophesied verse from Psalms that Jesus, would, that Jesus said. But Jesus says, look, I'm here to serve God. That's why I'm here. If, if Jesus in his humanness, now we know this. Again, you put this into context. In Jesus' last hours, he went to pray and he basically asked God if this is really the way God wanted him to do it. Didn't he? Remember that? And he asked him three times, right? And then immediately he said, your will be done. So, so we know that in Jesus' humanness, and remember he was fully human at that time, being guided by the Holy Spirit, just like regular human beings. In his humanness, he did not want to die an awful, terrible death on the cross. But he did it to honor God. He did it because that's what God sent him there to do. Jesus came to sacrifice himself for us. Now, we need to be people who joyfully serve others. That's why we come to church. That's why we worship together. A, a perfect example of Jesus pleasing people for the right reason was the lady who came. Remember when the, uh, the lady prostitute or the lady that had an affair and they were all going to stone her? Remember? And, uh, and Jesus shows up on the scene and they're all screaming and yelling and they've all got rocks in their hands and they're about, to, they're about to kill her. And Jesus forgave her and said, y'all remember? Whoever here doesn't have sin in their life, you be the first one to what? You throw the first rock. And what happened? As a matter of fact, they believed Jesus was down writing something. A lot of theologians believe Jesus was writing Theodore cussed last week. So-and-so had too much to drink. It was like he was writing out their sins, and they're all going, ooh, and they're dropping their rocks, and they're going off. And, and Jesus said, you're forgiven. And the world watches that, and they, they watch us use the Word of God for the truths, the true right and wrongs, and, and the things that we know we have to live by, the essentials. And they say, well, you're not Jesus. Jesus just forgave everybody for everything. But the next sentence, Jesus said, now go and sin no more. Repentance. Your forgiveness comes from your repentance. If that lady right then had said, thank you so much for saving me, and gone off and done it again, she, that was not non-repentant. She wouldn't have been forgiven for her sins. See, people love pulling the parts out that they like. They don't like the stuff that doesn't match up to who they want to be. Verse 8, 29 in Romans, he says, For God knew in advance and chose us to become like His Son, so that his son would be the firstborn among 
many brothers and sisters. Number two, have faith in God's promises. If you want to be this kind of person that's the right kind of people pleaser, then you have to have faith in God's promises. Such things were written in the Scripture long ago to teach us, verse 4 says, and the Scriptures gives us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. We become self-denying as we all rely on God and we count on God's promises. Number three, Live in the Spirit as a follower of Christ. This is what's going to get you that love and joy and peace that we talked about just a minute ago. Live in the Spirit. Keep your spiritual antenna up. Be aware all the time. I told you all, the week before last, uh, uh, three times that week, somebody came to mind and I texted them and said, Hey, you just came to mind. I prayed for you. All three of them text back almost immediately. You wouldn't believe how good the timing is on this because this is happening in my life. That same day, Joy texts somebody because somebody came to mind. And that person texts back, Oh, Joy, you wouldn't believe how much I needed this right now in my life. Stay connected with the Spirit. And what will happen is, is God will use you to do amazing things to help change people's lives. Verse 5, May God who gives... Circle who gives. May God who gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for the followers of Christ. God gives us what we need to be who we're supposed to be. Number four, worship together. That's so important. Worshiping together. Serving together. Glorifying God together. Verse six, then... Obviously, if there's a then, there's something that comes before it. He just got through saying how important it was for us to live in harmony and to, and to live according to God's Word. And, and he says, And then all of you join together with one voice, giving praise to the glory of God and the Father, our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number five. Humbly accept others and give God the glory. I think that's where most Christians messed up, mess up. Because we take pride in our Christianity. You can't. You can't take pride in your Christianity because it ain't you. It's God. It's all about God. We give God the glory. And, and I know it sounds cheesy when you hear somebody say, Give God the glory. And, and sometimes when people say give God the glory all the time, they're proud about saying give God the glory all the time. But, but the bottom line is, are you, are you thanking God for all the stuff that's happened in your life? And, and are you giving God the glory? Therefore, accept each other just as Christ accepted you so that God will be given glory. So I, I, I want us to go into our time with God to end the service and and I'm going to, I'm going to, I just wrote down some things that are not in your notes. But, but I got to thinking, to, to be the church that we're supposed to be, if, if we're a church of these people, then, then these verses give us some things as a church that we can be. And, and I want you to think about, are we this church? Because I believe this is who we are. This is who we strive to be. And you've got to ask yourself, am I a part of that? Go ahead and bring the lights down, Danae. Just listen to these things for a second. Who should we be as a church? In verse 1, go back and look at these later. In verse 1, we're told to be a place of refuge where people find help. Would you agree to that? Are you a part of that? Number two, a place to learn. It's where our faith and lives are built. Number three, a place centered on Christ, in verse 3. A place centered on Christ where Jesus is the model. In verse 4, a place filled with the Word of God where Scriptures are known and applied to everyday life. That's us, isn't it? I mean, be thinking about the people in your life that need this. 
Verses 4 and 5, he says that it's a place of prayer. We, we grow in endurance and faith. Let me tell you something. The last four weeks on Tuesday night, a group of LCCers came out here, and it was different people every night, and the largest group was this last Tuesday night, and they walked around the building, and they prayed about us growing the love and changing the world, and they prayed about us getting the finances that we need to, 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 to raise that building. And I want to tell you something. I, I know, Danae, I'm going to brag on you for just a second. Danae has MS. That's not a secret, right? And if you notice, she has a cane all the time, and sometimes she's really weak. And it was 100 degrees Tuesday night, and Danae came out here and made a lap around this building. It took a while, didn't it? She did it. Isn't that all? No, that's, just, that's faith, and that's, and that's sacrifice, and that's prayer, and that's the, that's the kind of prayer and the sacrifice that, that God's going to use, that one day we're going to wake up, wake up and go, can you all believe this? We, this? It's happening. It's happening now, and people are coming off the streets, and their lives are being changed, and, and they're coming to know Jesus, and they're using us, and people are getting baptized, and, 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 and we're going to have to look for something else, and th- those are the things that are going to happen as we continue to be a place of prayer and we grow in our endurance and our faith. And in verse 4, it's a place of acceptance, an atmosphere of understanding and hope. Look, I don't care what's gone on in your life. You're welcome here at Life Connection Church. Your friend that you think won't fit in. He's got too many tattoos or too many... No, he will fit in. If the, only, the only reason he would be uncomfortable here is because he thinks that we wouldn't accept him. But when he walks in, he's going to feel loved and accepted here. And if you don't, I'm going to slap you. <laughs> because that's who we are. At verse 5, he says, It's a place of togetherness where unity is recognized as a part of our DNA. And in verse 8, a place of witness to the life of Jesus and acceptance of others into the family of Christ-like believers. Let me ask you something. You come to LCC because you love it here and it makes a difference in your life. What friends are you praying about to come and be a part of this family? Because you know it's going to make a difference for them. And you know what? Their whole life, they will go God made a difference in my life, but Jonathan's the one that brought me. Richard's the one that brought me. Lindsay's the one that brought me to that point. And there may be people you've been asking, don't quit. You keep telling them your buttology, the way God is changing your life, and then there's going to come a point when they're ready, and it may be a hard time when they're going to ask you, can I come with you to your church next week? 